Good morning, and welcome to the second session of the Park Source Partner Symposium. I am Erin Chernow, Senior Vice President of Operations for Park Source, and I'll be your host this morning. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Chief Product Officer Dave Brennan, to discuss how you can maximize uptime, expanding capacity, and improving HTM performance. Hi, Dave. Hey, Erin. Thanks for the handoff. I appreciate it. Kind intro. So good morning, all. Uh, and welcome to Real World Challenges and Solutions, maximizing uptime, expanding capacity, and improving HTM performance. I am joined today by three outstanding professionals. And I think uh, if our count is correct, we've got over 100 years of experience in clinical engineering here. So um, this is going to be outstanding. In no particular order, uh, I'd like to welcome Ed Lanthier, Manager of Clinical Engineering for Collida Health. Larry Hertzler, the owner and principal of Hertzler Clinical Engineering, and Sharon Felucio, president of Mantis Medical Compliance Group. Thank you all for being here. If anyone would like to see their bios, which are really impressive, they're on the partsource.com event uh, website. And without further ado, we'll jump into it. Um, so thanks for being here today. I love these sessions and I love getting a diverse group of people together. I was just on the last session, it was an incredible discussion. Um, and, and it really highlights our focus on partnership, which our company is built on. We partner with OEMs, with, with ISOs, with healthcare providers across the country, and we love to share ideas and share knowledge. And that's really what today is about. Um, we really want to focus today on HTM challenges and the creative solutions that you have seen and experienced in your environments. And I think this is, this is a critical time for this discussion. As everybody on the line knows, the healthcare system in the U.S. is under incredible uh, pressure, whether it's reimbursement rates or, or new kinds of patients and new numbers of patients. Uh, margins are dropping, costs are rising. We're in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, now more than ever, we have to get creative about doing more than with less. Stated differently, every healthcare provider that I talk to is continuously seeking new and creative ways to drive efficiencies, to maximize limited resources. Some of them just to keep their head above water, others to expand and, and, uh, and really drive outstanding performance with their clinical partners. So you three have been living this, you have been na navigating these challenges firsthand. So I thought we should get your perspective. And we think about these in three different kinds of categories. First is uptime, right? Looking at mission critical medical equipment and making sure it's operational when your clinicians need it, when your patients need it. Expanding capacity, which is all about optimizing your team, uh, whether that's carving out time to take on new responsibilities or just focusing more effectively on your most critical tasks. Uh, and then at the end, making sure you're driving true performance improvement time uh, period over time period, um, year over year, making sure that the continuous improvements are actually translating into cost, into efficiency gains, into quality gains uh, for your, your hospitals, for your patients, for your clinicians, for your partners. So it's a big, it's a big topic. Um, and Ed, maybe I'll start with you. Thanks for joining us today. Um, when you think about these challenges, uptime, capacity, performance, what has been most uh, prevalent for you in recent months? And what are the key strategies that you have employed or begun to employ to be successful? Well, good morning. The greatest challenges in healthcare technology management, actually my whole career, but it's been getting more acute lately, is uh, we are getting uh, more financial pressure because of lowering reimbursement rates. So the hospital has less money to work with. Uh, Coupled with that, I have an aging biomed workforce as uh, everyone knows the average age is pretty high and I have a very experienced team. So I'm starting to lose some of the most experienced people either through uh, having to go out on disability or by retiring. Uh, and with that advanced technologies, we're, so we're using more advanced technologies in healthcare. Uh, more and more stuff is tied in with the EMR. So we, I need a uh, team that has greater capabilities. Uh, so the people I do have on the team, I'm pushing towards those higher ends. I'm very limited. I uh, cannot hire any FTEs at this point. And I can't fill uh, disabilities because they're considered as active employees. So we started looking at the contractors we were using. 
and being critical of some of them. And some of the contractors we were using really weren't doing the job that we needed. So uh, how do we proceed from there? So as we were looking more into that uh, and the hospital puts a little pressure, you can't really add new vendors. They wanna have a smaller list of vendors. So our look was, uh, how do we use our PartSource Pro uh, partnership to be able to do that? So in 2019, mm -hmm. we talked to PartSource about what is it that we could do to be able to use on-site service just like parts? And serendipitously, they were already doing that uh, to a level. So maybe it was a beta, maybe it was a little bit early on that, uh, but we had looked at it, uh, some options there. I had somebody that I've worked with in a professional relationship through all my different employers who's really been terrific, high integrity, uh, understands the business, uh, somebody I could trust, and that was Sharon Paluzio, who uh, had started a company called Mantis in Rochester. So uh, we looked at uh, what kind of things can we, could we do to start that relationship where uh, she could augment uh, the things that we're doing and uh, to be able to grow, do some modifications, be able to customize it so that it met part sources needs, uh, Kaleida's needs, and Mantis's needs so that everybody won. That's great. That's great. And we thrive on that partnership, uh, Ed. So we love the, the design and development uh, partnership that you've offered us over, over the years. Um, Sharon, so, so you know, uh, maybe you can elaborate on that uh, from the service provider perspective. Um, you've been part of the Parts for Service Network for a little bit now. Uh, how has that enabled you to be a better partner with Ed? Well, you know, I was thrilled when Ed came to me for assistance in this. Uh, we talked about how we could help. Um, they had some service needs that were immediate and compliance was suffering um, from, uh, I guess, a lack of service provided from other vendors. And becoming a vendor with Kaleida was such a long process. We thought, oh, we can't wait for months to do something. So collaborating with PartSource and the service network, um, having the vendor onboarding um, with PartSource being such a simple, easy process, we were able to kind of pull it together very, very quickly and meet the needs immediately. Um, we were able to jump right in, start providing service, closing the gap on the compliance issues, maxim maximizing um, equipment uptime and improving the overall um, performance of the service platform. So. Um, it, it was it was so easy and it worked out so well. So I, I'm not really sure how it would have worked out if the part source service network wasn't in place um, because we were able to step right in. So over time, the program has developed uh, a lot of moving parts and uh, through the teamwork um, communication by all three entities, we've really created a successful program there. Um, the other benefit is that Mantis deliver service when and where Kaleida needs it. And so when they don't need the extra support, we can redirect our technicians to other customers. So this partnership really helps everyone involved. Um, PartSource better serves their clients, Kaleida better supports their clinical teams, and Mantis increases its own service operations. So for us, it was a no brainer to participate in this program and it really is a win-win scenario. That's great, that's great. And I appreciate your comments about the the flexible nature um, and, and meeting Ed's and Kaleida's needs uh, that way. Um, I think that'll tie nicely, Larry, into, into my next question for you. I mean, you've, you've seen these competitive dynamics play out uh, across large national networks, numerous hospital systems. The need for cost out, the need for high quality um, is, not a, is not a new need. Um, as you, in your experience as you, and, and thinking about the future what strategies do you think HTM teams are pursuing, should be pursuing to continue to increase their, their capacity to in, continue to improve their performance? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, and, and in your intro, when you said uh, there was 100 years of experience here, I'm glad you weren't referring only to me, although I have been around for quite a long time. Uh, but, but one of the things that uh, is, is still there, I mean, we're, we're still trying to answer some of the same exact questions that we were early on. We're still trying to use data to do that. 
I think the big difference, as as you've seen with uh, with with what Ed and Sharon have talking about, there's a lot more resources available today that didn't used to be didn't used to be there. So every clinical engineering manager is always trying to I think about it from a, an optimizing perspective. There's there's some type of a an optimization that you can do that takes advantage of all the resources that are out there in the best way possible. Um, with all the changes and the different things that are moving on, you know, the, the resource availability gives you different abilities to do things that, that frankly just didn't exist in the past. I mean, I think about one, uh, one friend and former colleague who took things a little bit to extreme. He was faced like many people are today with, uh, with a budget cut mandate and, uh, and a hiring freeze, but, uh, but also a, a mandate to reduce costs. And so he took the tactic of um, he was he was doing all of the biomed work himself, and they were outsourcing all of the DI work. Since he couldn't hire staff to take on the DI work, he trained all of his BMETs to do the imaging, and then he contracted out all of the biomedical work because there were some great local providers for that, and they didn't have DI providers around. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's, let's dig into that. I think that's a, that's a common scenario these days. People are looking for how to do that exactly. Um, and, and of course in 2020 with COVID being a real force, um, it has upended budgets. We have unprecedented spend levels in unforecasted categories, coast to coast capital budgets are low or in some cases gone operating budgets are, are under incredible pressure training budgets, you know, tough to come by. So, so where do you turn? How do you, how do you think about that, that uh, availability and those options that you mentioned uh, a minute ago? Yeah, I think um, everybody in this business knows that uh, when you go into work in the morning, you never know what to expect. Something's going to be a little bit different, uh, whether it's an employee issue or some other, uh, some, something else that's crazy. COVID is kind of an, an extreme example of that. Um, you know, when you think about um, treating which equipment pieces in the hospital are mission critical, that made a major shift. And so people always have plans or should always have plans in place. You know, the old saying, if you, know, if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail, um, holds very true in, in this business. So people almost always have, you know, what are my backup plans? What are my contingencies for the things that are mission critical? But really, this has kind of showed you need to go beyond that. You really need to understand what the impacts of downtime are for all the different pieces of equipment. So service delivery plans for, for just about everything that's out there um, and figuring out what are you going to do differently. Now, again, what, one of the things that, uh, that PartSource has announced that I'm kind of excited to see how it really works, this on-site service capability, the data capabilities that you have puts a lot more in the fingertips of everybody that's, you know, everybody that's in this business than, than was there a month ago. Um, so the ability to see actual data, you know, the, the proof, the quality, the performance, um, but, but not only that, it gives you the ability to even plan better. Right now, everybody's had those experiences where, you know, you have things under an OEM contract maybe, or you're using OEMs and time and materials, but sometimes their techs aren't available. What do you do? Now you have another option that wasn't there before. You can, you can quickly find people that you really didn't even know were, were in the business maybe and, and potentially use them to your advantage. So, so I think back to the optimization perspective, you've got a lot more things to look at just to, to really be aware of um, in, in trying times when there's big changes going on. Yeah, I love that word optimization. Um, I think that's right. And you mentioned uh, options. Uh, Sharon mentioned, mentioned flexibility. It's all in that pursuit of, of optimization. And, and that's something that we at PartSource take near and dear to, to heart, the, uh, the use of technology, the use of evidence-based um, planning and algorithms to, to help bring you towards that optimization. It's a constant goal. It's a constant continuous improvement project. But um, yeah, one, one, one thing just to add to that, I mean, the, the one common thing is there, there are always fires to put out. There are those urgency things. And, and half the time when that happens, if you're not expecting it, suddenly cost goes on the back burner. It's, you know, I've, I've got to fix this immediately. Well, it'd be great if you had the ability to keep cost into account 
Um, and now maybe you can, you know, maybe as you can see all the different options and the costs, you're not just abandoning it and, uh, and, and looking only towards uptime. Right, right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Over my career, I found out that if you're not managing the, if you're not watching the data and managing that way, then you're just reacting. So you really have to look at uh, where are my needs, where are my weaknesses, how am I addressing those? If I'm just coming in every day without a plan, bringing on today's fire, I'll be fighting fires the rest of my career. So you always have to have what's your plan and uh, how am I going to address that next? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ed, maybe you can expand on that. I mean, you know, incredible pressures, clinicians demanding high quality, you know, predictable re results, right? You're, you're, you're always in this continuous search. You just mentioned it, right? You're just reacting if you don't have a plan. As a leader, you're accountable. Um, what, what strategies, there are lots of other leaders on the line listening in, what strategies would you advise them to use to, you know, balance internal and external labor to do, to do just that, to not be reactive, but to be proactive in your approach? Well, you have to evaluate your team all the time. So what resource do I have in-house? Uh, the fastest way is always in-house guys, the staircase away. Uh, but I don't need to be that fast on everything. Uh, there are also other items that, uh, like we have a lot of legacy imaging equipment. So the OEMs don't really want to support that anymore. So uh, what am I going to do to augment the staff that I have to be able to support that legacy equipment? Uh, what am I going to do if uh, technician John tells me tomorrow that I have to go out for a surgery and I'll be out for two months? You know, what's my fill-in plan for that? So you're constantly looking at those things. Uh, what kind of resources do I have in the community? What kind of friends do I have that I can uh, call on for ideas? Uh, being able to weigh all those, knowing financials is always going to be there. So uh, how do I track what I've been spending, what are my mm -hmm. options, what kind of uh, things can I do? What kind of partners do I have that can help me to uh, create, you know, do something with those costs to be able to manage them? Uh, unfortunately, in New York State, we can't use alternative maintenance plans. Uh, that's not allowed by the State Department of Health. So I have to do the quality inspections on everything that I have. Uh, uh, some of them doesn't have to be today, some of them can be tomorrow. And then I just balance some of those ideas out. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's great. Mm -hmm. The balancing act for sure. Um, and I hear more and more about, you know, the, the sort of surprise, um, you know, you, you said John's surgery won't be in, <laughs> you know, the surprise uh, staffing challenges that, that are out there every, every day, maybe Sharon, um, maybe you see that from your chair as well. Uh, you've got incredible, depth and domain experience as an entrepreneur, building a business, lots of customers. How has COVID uh, in the near term sort of affected the resourcing plans on, in your client base? Um, and, and, and what strategies might you, might you recommend to others uh, as they continue to build out their teams, uh, their pursuit of excellence in, in pretty chaotic times? Yeah. Uh, so, well, we're all in this together. And I think that moving forward, um, we're all going to recognize that there is a lot of strength in the partnerships like this that we have. Um, as the uh, healthcare networks are stretched beyond their capacity and, and they have more requirements during the, the pandemic, um, vendors like Mantis can help fill in those gaps and create peace of mind and equipment maintenance. Um, so the healthcare teams are shifting and constricting and we're ready to plug right in. Um, for the facilities, uh, they pay for service and demand and they don't have the added overhead of payroll and um, additional staff and all of the expenses that come with that because it's just cost prohibitive right now. Um, so this helps them to focus on managing the new normal of the environment of COVID-19. Um, so, Mantis is also providing cost-saving initiatives in other areas from you know, acquisition of equipment, PPE, consumables, and that sort of thing. So the loss of revenues from this pandemic is strangling our clients and we're at the forefront of providing cost-saving solutions. And this partnership is providing immediate solutions. Um, so it's a, it's a really great thing. That's great, that's great. 
So Larry, maybe you can you can jump in on that as well. Um, you know, cost savings is 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 absolutely critical, uh, as as Sharon just said. You also mentioned proof points and quality points, and and you know, what is what does good look like for an in-house program? How do you how do you push towards excellence? Uh, how do you measure um, measure excellence when you've got a mixture of internal and external labor? Um, interested in how you think about that um, both today and, and what would you like to see in the future? Yeah, great question, Dave. And, and, I, and I think it's a, it's a question that probably every program manager has been asked at some point in their life, um, not just for in-house programs, but for, for ISOs and, and multi-vendor service programs as well. And, you know, it, it kind of gets me back to one of my favorite subjects of, of you know, the use of data. Um, that's out there. And I, I, I can remember showing trends to my executive team, you know, continuously, you know, getting better. And the question that came back was always, well, yeah, but how do you compare to anybody else? And it's a really difficult question to, to answer. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's about benchmarking. But as we all know, everybody does things a little bit different. There, there's some great publications that are out there and benchmarking guides and there's more work that's being done all the time on it. So I think it, it will continue to get better. But if you're only looking at the data um, in your own site, it's really hard to tell um, how you compare to everybody else. Um, and so I think benchmarks is where we have to go to get that. Again, one of the exciting things about um, you know, the, the, the part source data covers such a broad reach of, of suppliers and providers in the part space and now in the service space that may be able to give you a, a good look at how you compare ratios wise, how much are you doing yourself, how much are you sending out, all the different types of quality indicators that you're tracking might be some decent comparisons that you can use to, to show how, you know, how you look compared to other people that are out there. Benchmarking is not easy. Um, you know, again, a, a lot of people think benchmarks and averages are the same things. Um, they're, they're really not. You really have to understand what you're looking at, understand what's an outlier. If you've only got one particular type of CT in your site, it's pretty hard to know where it sits on the spectrum um, until you get data from, from everybody else. Yours could be best demonstrated, it could be worst demonstrated, but if you only have experience with that one CT, you have no way of knowing whether it's performing better than it should or worse than it should. Um, and the same thing is really true regardless of the metrics that you're looking at. So, so I think the important point is to find ways to look outside of, of your comfort zones. Um, you know, don't, don't be afraid to look at data that might say, you know what, I've got a lot, a lot to do here. Um, maybe you prove it wrong. Uh, maybe you are the best demonstrated case that's out there, but uh, maybe you're not. And then talk to all the other people that are trying to get better and, and figure out some ways to move forward. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We believe that philosophy, of course, at, at Parts First, we spend a, in a great deal of time curating data and making sure we're benchmarking and make, make, making sure we're passing that along to our customers. As, as you know, we have a strong belief um, that if you don't measure it, you can't control it. If you don't measure it, you can't improve it. If you don't share that uh, measurement uh, with, your, with your suppliers, with your customers, with your employees, uh, with all of your partners, then you can't drive the industry forward and, and make gains, real gains, sustainable gains in cost out, in quality, in efficiency. Um, so we're, we're always striving to, to look for different ways to add to those measurements, and, um, and I, I definitely appreciate your comments there. And Sharon, maybe I'll maybe I'll turn that into a, a question for you, as an entrepreneur, as a, as a business owner, as somebody who I know personally prides herself on the quality of of your work, your team's work, your dedication to the highest standards of quality and and, and rigorous execution. Um, you know, this world of measuring service that we're talking about and benchmarking, um, how does that strike you? Um, and, and do you think, you know, OEMs, uh, ISOs in general, how will people react to having service and external labor be measured in new and, and, and different ways? Well, um, I gotta say, you know, tactically this program um, provides immediate time and cost savings for Mantis. 
Um, so we have less time focused on demand generation and marketing as part source uh, funnels quotes to bid on in the areas where we operate. Um, at the end of the day, part source is a partner bringing Mantis new service opportunities and supporting the growth of our organization. And strategically, part source is driving continuous improvement efforts by providing me engineer feedback from each client and metrics on their performance and benchmark data versus my peers, which only makes Mantis stronger and smarter and ultimately more effective. Um, so this would be the case uh, with any of the or other organizations involved. Um, this relationship has really begun to increase already in, in other areas where we have uh, more and more client base developing through this program. Um, so I think it's uh, refreshing. It keeps us all on our toes, uh, keeps us all driving quality because we know that we're going to be compared to other providers in our area. Yeah, for sure. I think it's always important that that data be honest too. Uh, if, I, if I let the metrics be driving the car instead of me looking at a dashboard and driving it myself, I'm gonna find that the data is always gonna say a different story than reality. It's really important to have a partner that will stick with you, be honest, give you real data so that you can make changes and tweaks and uh, adjustments. Absolutely. I, I think communication to that point is, is just key. Um, you know, you can benchmark and, and, you know, create data on all kinds of metrics, but um, I think it's really important to get these teams together and hash out any bumps in the road and, you know, just continually together having those discussions to improve the, the platform that you're using. Um, and that's what we've been doing. All three of, of our entities have been, um, you know, very, very good at getting together and communicating and continually trying to make it a better program. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And thank you for all that, Jaren. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great partnership. It's a great yeah. partnership. Yes. Well, this is great. This is wonderful. Thank you for the, um, for the time today. I love, I've been taking notes here. I love the discussion about data. I love the discussion about um, knowing your options and building plans and making sure you have flexible, uh, creative solutions, backups, contingencies. I, I love, uh, Larry, your, your discussion of optimization and managing the variables to pursue that, that optimization. Um, and, uh, and, and hopefully the, this, uh, this notion of how to measure appropriately in, in the labor space is a, is a conversation we will continue to have because I think it's, it's one of the spend categories that um, gets the least amount of oversight, overwatch, control. And, and I believe that you can um, get much better benefits out of the things that you do measure and control. So, um, so anyway, any other comments, any last thoughts or advice for the HTM crowd out there listening in before we, uh, before we adjourn. If not, thank you so much for your time today. It's been wonderful. And we thank look you. forward to uh, talking again soon. Erin, I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate the time, Ed, Larry, Sharon. We appreciate the insights and the examples about improving HTM performance to expand capacity. Please join me for our next session, on-site service, your connection to better services here. To join the next session, you need to leave the current meeting and return to the session presentation or the landing page. From the session landing page, click Partner Symposium and click on the next session title. See you there. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everyone.